and tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Well, hey there, friends. It's a special night tonight, you know. The season two finale. So, of course, we're going out with a bang. Well, all right, Chester. I did promise. Tonight you can come inside and listen, but you gotta be quiet, okay? And you gotta wipe your feet. And one fart, and you're gone, got it? All right, everyone, come on in. Let's get this party started. Mm. All right, that's better. So tonight we've got it. Zip it. So tonight we've got a tale from our pal W.B. Stickle, who you can also hear in this season's episode 14 and the finale of season one. <sighs> so smoke them if you've got them and drink those glasses to the bottom because old Drew Blood has a tale to tell. But first, a rigmarole. Hey, you're listening to the standard edition of this program. To get instant access to ad-free versions of all our episodes and hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu. Sign up today. It's a great way to show your support, and you'll get a whole lot for it. And authors... Send your scary stories to DrewBloodHorror at gmail.com. If you're selected, you'll get that full treatment. Shit. In tonight's story, we join Thomas Vogel, a widowed treasure hunter about to receive a transformative visit. So, without further delay, I give you, from author W.B. Stickle, Quiddity. Dragging a weary hand down his face, Thomas Vogel leaned over and grabbed the bottle of Kilbegan sitting on the floor next to his plush office chair. The movement caused his chair's aged leather to issue an accusatory groan. Oh, fuck you, Thomas murmured to it. It's been a long winter and I put on a few pounds. No need to be an asshole. He waited to see if the chair had anything else to add. It didn't then threw back a lengthy swig of the harsh Irish whiskey. The liquor seared its way down his esophagus and filled his torso with a caustic but not unpleasant warmth. Smiling at it, Thomas set the bottle on his desktop in front of him and inched his chair forward until his belly was touching the desk's edge. Okay then, he said, shifting his attention to his laptop's 17-inch display. On it, Pictures of his late wife, Karen, cycled every few seconds. Her spray-painting a rose at Graffiti Park in Austin, Texas. The two of them curled up in a hammock out back. Her dancing her ass off at a Chili Peppers concert. Her staring adoringly at him as he posed in his navy whites. A close-up of her face, which he had taken while she stood naked in the shower. She had only let him keep the image after he promised to crop out all the naughty bits. Thomas lingered on the memory and felt a familiar wave of nostalgia wash over him, which, of course, was the point of these particular pictures, to remind him of all the wondrous times they had had throughout their journey together, and to highlight how amazing and carefree Karen had been before her demons had arrived and changed everything. No, no, his inner voice cut in as it always seemed to whenever he tried focusing on the good parts. Not just changed, they ruined everything. <sighs> ruined, he heard himself whisper. And like that, the nostalgia he was feeling was gone. The picture on the laptop screen changed then, switching to a shot of Thomas and Karen standing in front of their newly purchased sportscraft fishing boat. Thomas blinked numbly at the image and frowned. 
when he'd first configured the screensaver slideshow. He started with a pool of 50 and reduced it to 26. Lovely as it may have been, this photo hadn't even been part of the initial 50, which begged the question, how had it ended up in there? Sure it wasn't you. His inner voice edged in again. Been hitting the whiskey pretty hard lately. Maybe you did it and just don't remember. Thomas eyed the Kilbeggins bottle. Though he was loath to admit it, the hypothesis certainly had its merits. Maybe, he said. As he did, a strange buzzing sensation purled in his head, and he felt his thoughts fracture and fragment. The sensation didn't hurt exactly, but it sure made it difficult to concentrate. It took a few minutes for the feeling to subside. Once it had, Thomas found that he no longer cared about the additional image. It was there now, probably a result of his having moved it there during one of his numerous blackouts. So that was that. What concerned him more was his reasoning for visiting the study in the first place. The other photo collection. The special one. Right, he said, grabbing the laptop's wireless mouse. He gave it a little jerk and the screensaver ended. Behind it awaited a small prompt asking for a username and password. Once past this, he launched a file explorer app and commenced navigating his way through the hard drive's directory structure. Twenty or so clicks later, he arrived at a folder called Registry Extensions, within which resided 38 subfolders, each bearing a five-digit label. Thomas scrolled down to the one marked 47782 and clicked on it, bringing up another username and password prompt. He entered the appropriate credentials and clicked OK. The password window vanished, revealing a collection of 14 high-resolution JPEGs. Taking another swig from the bottle, Thomas opened the topmost pick. The laptop's mediocre processor whirred with activity as it coerced its outmoded graphics card to display what appeared to be a large, keg-shaped something nestled in the ocean floor. If he remembered correctly, it had been mid-autumn when he had taken the pick. He had been out in the sports craft, trolling the depths of Wausau Sound in search of sunken treasure, a hobby of his since the late 90s. As was his habit, he had selected a spot at random, dropped anchor, and cast his fancy magnetometer into the shimmering waters. Almost immediately, the device had begun beeping. Figuring it had to be a glitch, Thomas had reeled it back in, hooked it up to his computer, and initiated a set of diagnostics. When those came back clean, he generated a findings report which indicated a mass the size and shape of a large boat anchor. Boat anchor, Thomas thought as he studied the object. Not quite. He was just about to close the image and move on to his favorite in the collection, the 13th, when a white-hot ball of pain swept through the pleura surrounding his left lung. <laughs> Christ almighty! He said, thrusting backwards and clutching a hand to his chest. The ball took three more passes through his torso before disintegrating into an echo of pain. <laughs> Fucking fuck, Thomas said, sitting up and collecting himself. While Karen's demons had been largely mental, Thomas's main tormentor, mesothelioma, was a decidedly physical one. Between the coffin fits, bouts of fatigue, and random plural flares, like the one he had just experienced, he rarely went an hour without being reminded of its presence inside him. <sighs> I hadn't forgotten, he told the disease as he lifted the Kilbeggins bottle to his lips. <sighs> you and me until the end. He drained the last two swigs of whiskey and set the bottle back on the floor. After a time, his gaze returned to the laptop and the last image displayed there, image 13, a close-up shot of the object's fully excavated front end. As he had with the first pick, Thomas thought back to the day he had taken it and recalled how goddamn arduous it had been to chip away all the barnacles and plankton covering the thing. 
Equipped with the most basic of tools, a hammer, chisel, and heavy-duty scraper, it had taken four different dives and four oxygen tanks to get the job done. Brutal work, but as the sand went, the juice had definitely been worth the squeeze. Without it, he might never have discovered the five small digits embossed across its black metal surface. 47782 Nine months had passed since that fateful day. Eight months since he had learned what the digits meant, and he still had trouble processing the magnitude of what he had found. The fact that he, Thomas Vogel, amateur treasure hunter with a death sentence in his lung, had been the one to discover it truly boggled his mind. Given how many others, to include three major government expeditions, had been looking for it since it disappeared some 70 years ago. The odds it would be him had to be astronomical, like winning the lottery astronomical. In a way, Thomas supposed he had won the lottery, a different kind of lottery, sure, but one that would surely reap its own sizable rewards. Money, at the very least, some fame and notoriety, and a place in the history books if he had his way. But that was a little bit of the old cart before the horse, wasn't it? He still had to wrest the thing from the seabed, a task he reckoned would take a minimum of four more digs, assuming some fucking hurricane didn't come along and undo all his work in the meantime. Then, of course, came the matter of getting it out of the water and onto his boat, something he had no idea how to do. Thomas sighed wearily at the thought. How indeed... He started to say when a door creaked somewhere in his large Victorian manor. Alarmed, Thomas swiveled his chair around and faced the study's open doorway. Beyond it, total darkness reigned. The creaking paused, resumed again, and was followed by a gentle tapping sound. Having spent his entire childhood in the manor, and having eventually moved back in after his father passed away in the mid-90s, Thomas knew all of the structure's murmurs and susurrations intimately. What he had just heard was the door leading from the kitchen into the rear courtyard opening and closing, which was odd because he distinctly remembered locking it after doing the dishes. Hoping he had imagined the sound, Thomas sat still and listened intently to the house. For a few seconds there was nothing. Then the faint little creaks began working their way inward from the kitchen. What the fuck? He whispered, opening the desk's top right drawer where his 38 revolver lived. After lifting it out and checking to see it was loaded, he set the gun on the desk and pulled the laptop shut, extinguishing the LCD's glow. The creaking paused in concert with this, then abruptly sped up, seeming to head straight for the study. Startled, Thomas stood, grabbed the gun, and cocked the hammer. Keep on coming if you want a bullet in the face, he said. The intruder stopped somewhere in the hallway. Thomas raised a 38. Whoever you are, please don't be stupid. Walk away now, and nothing happens. Stay, and things get ugly. A hushed chortle warmed its way through the open doorway. With it came a cold, husky voice. I'd say things are already ugly, wouldn't you? Funny, Thomas said. How about we keep them from getting any uglier? <laughs> the intruder grunted softly in the dark but said nothing. An uneasy silence filled the air. Seconds ticked by. Well... Thomas finally called out. What'll it be? As the words left his tongue, it occurred to him how uncommonly put together he felt. He was on edge, yes, charged with adrenaline, but he didn't feel scared or panicky. If anything, he felt at peace with the situation. Whether this was the whiskey's doing, or the mesothelioma's, or a combo of the two, he couldn't say but he was glad for it all the same. Interesting, the intruder said. Thomas had barely registered this when a leaden fist came hurtling out of the dark, striking him in the temple, 
and sending him headlong into unconsciousness. A short time later, the sound of a clock striking three roused Thomas from his forced slumber. As he gradually wakened, the last vestiges of the dream he had been having echoed faintly in his head. While the details were sketchy, he knew it had been about Karen and that he had been enjoying it. <sighs> Karen, he muttered, flittering open his eyes and watching the firelight dance about the manor's spacious communion room. Realizing he was no longer in the study, Thomas sat upright and panned across the large room. Taking in all the antique curios, armoires, tapestries, sofas, and claw-footed side pieces that adorned it, including the green shea lounge upon which he currently lay. A subtle movement brought his gaze to the vaulted chair directly across from him. Welcome back, the man sitting in it said. Thomas frowned as his brain struggled to make sense of the situation. <sighs> Who the hell are you? The man, who sported a totally bald head and gray beard and wore a dated tweed suit, crossed his legs, smiled, and said, Just a visitor. All at once, everything came rushing back to Thomas. The door creaking open, footsteps, being attacked. <sighs> what is this? He demanded, leaping up from the shay. What the fuck are you doing in my goddamn house? Please, sit. Relax. Thomas went to tell him to go fuck himself, but instead did as the man instructed. I'm sitting, he said, easing himself back onto the Shea Lounge. I don't know why, but I am. The product of consumption, the man explained, a glint of pleasure in his eyes. What? Your fight or flight instinct. I liberated it. Trust me, it's for the best. Thomas sneered at this, shook his head. I ask you who you are and what you're doing here. He glanced down at himself and noted that he was dressed in plaid pajamas. And how did I get in these? My name. The man replied, Is Eldon Headley, and I dressed you in those while you were unconscious. You vomited all over yourself after you fell, so I changed you. He gazed querulously about the communion room. I'm curious about this chamber. It's the only one in the house decorated in antiquity. Is there a story behind it? My wife Karen's doing, Thomas responded compliantly. She was obsessed with antiques. When we moved in after my father passed, she wanted to decorate the whole place according to its Victorian design. I like modern decor, so I said no. We compromised on this room and... She ran with it. Thomas paused and glared at the old man. Now, why the fuck did I just tell you all that? Tricks of the trade, my boy. <laughs> Tricks of the trade. Just answer the fucking question, will you? Eldon Headley grinned, revealing a chasm of abnormally long teeth. His whole body then blurred, and in the next instant, he was sitting on the shea beside Thomas. He carried with him a sickly sweet scent, like strawberries mixed with upturned earth, and had Thomas's 38 gripped in his large right hand. Thomas flinched. <sighs> How did you... Smith and Wesson, the man cut in, flipping open the 38 cylinder and letting the bullets fall to the floor. A well-crafted weapon. Hardy stainless steel, composite rubber grip. He closed his hand around the gun, and Thomas watched it crumple like a beer can. The man squeezed harder, and when he reopened his hand, the gun was a ball of steel and rubber. Heavens, Thomas said. What the hell are you? Headley turned his head and peered directly into Thomas's eyes. 
His face, Thomas now saw, was like that of a death camp survivor. Skeletal and pale, the eyes sunken, the cheekbones sharp. There is an old Greek word for what I am, but you would know me by a somewhat violent term. He waited for Thomas to guess. Thomas considered everything he just witnessed. The display of speed and strength, the teeth, and though it went against his better judgment, he said, Vampire? The man stood and moved to the sofa next to the lounge, giving Thomas his space. Unfortunately, that is the closest approximation we have, and quite a poor and distant one it is. Thomas recoiled. <laughs> Did you come here to drink my blood? As soon as he asked the question, he felt ridiculous for having asked it. A fabrication of pseudo-imaginative men, Headley said, steepling his long fingers together. No, my kind prefers convectius quiditas. When Thomas showed no sign of having heard of it, he went on. It is an old term that medieval philosophers once used to encapsulate the essence of a thing. The whatness of it. Applied to humanity, it is your vitality, your very being. Right, Thomas said, not getting it, but thinking it sounded like a bunch of pretentious metaphysical bullshit. So, it's not flowing in my veins then? Not as such. The conduit of quiddity in humans lies within your psyches. The old man leaned toward Thomas, shadows dancing on his bony face. You, my friend, are radiating with it, which is what attracted me to you. Lucky for you, others of my kind did not find you first. Thomas turned away from his uninvited guest and pondered everything the man had just told him. Part of him outright rejected it all as pure lunacy. A much bigger part, however, believed it. Pretentiousness and all. He could feel the bigger part rapidly consuming the littler part. I see you have some questions, said Headley. Thomas laughed. <laughs> the king of all understatements. So, ask. Thomas sat up straight. He noticed the pain in his head had receded, though a slight dizziness remained. He cleared his throat. <clears throat> Are you, um, dead? The corners of Headley's lips twitched upwards. Yes and no. One night in December of 1793, I went to sleep and changed. In the genetic sense, to use the current vernacular, all of my cells shut down and rebooted themselves. When I awoke, I no longer functioned by the same physical rules that you do. And yeah, there are other rules. He waved his hand. It is far more complex than that, of course. But I deduce you get the general idea. Thomas took a beat to let it all sink in, which it did far more easily than it seemed it should have. Did you originally plan on feeding on me? Certainly, Headley replied. And in fact, I have fed on you. Just a little bit. It was quite impossible not to. It's why you're so amenable right now. Thomas bridled at that. Would your feeding have killed me? I would have drawn it out over weeks and months. But eventually, yes. The process would have stopped your neurons from functioning. Thomas stared absently across the room. I'm almost afraid to ask, but what made you change your mind about me? 
The long, jagged teeth reappeared and Headley extended a long arm to the room's marble coffee table, where Thomas's laptop sat with its screen closed. The frycolicist picked the device up, opened the screen, and tapped the spacebar, bringing up a mosaic of photographs. Because you found this. Thomas's brow furrowed. You know what that is? The man regarded the photos with an almost loving gaze. February 5th, 1958, he said in way of an answer. I was living in Canada at the time, but kept frequent tabs on news from around the world. Some that was much harder back then, but possible if you had the resources. Anyway, over the next few months, I followed the recovery efforts and became intrigued by the U.S. government's utter failure to gain any closure. Later, when they officially called off the search, I relocated to Tybee Island and vowed to find it myself. He huffed. Huh. The place was quite different than I remembered. But then, it was my first time back to Georgia since I was stationed at Fort Scraven. Back in 62, a glorious time that was, the American Civil War. Such sustenance. He looked off into space, appearing lost in reverie. I looked for it now and then for almost 20 years. Finally... The Tang Shan earthquake drew my interest to northeast China, and off I went. Thomas rubbed his chin. Oh, why were you so interested in it back then? And what could you possibly want with it now? Headley handed the laptop to Thomas. What I'd rather talk about is why you want it. Thomas eyed the images on the screen momentarily then set the laptop on the coffee table and wandered over to the fireplace. Across the mantel stood a dozen family photos. Thomas honed in on the one of he and Karen sharing a kiss beneath the Eiffel Tower. It had been taken during their honeymoon by a friendly Parisian who was the antithesis of French stereotypes. Thomas never tired of staring at that photo. He had been 25, Karen 24 both of them appearing so young and vibrant. I sense a story coming, Headley said. Excellent. So you know, this makes me want to bash your head in, Thomas said, referring to the overwhelming compulsion he felt to explain himself. He inhaled deeply and let it out through his nose. My wife Karen had already been in a state of decline when we first met. Bipolar disorder which she inherited from both of her parents. To her credit, she had a pretty good grip on it when we crossed paths at Savannah State. She was nervous when she broke the news to me, but I was battling a serious bout of depression back then and told her not to sweat it. We all have our shit, right? She literally sang with relief. Singing was one of her coping mechanisms. We married during our senior year and I joined the Navy after graduation. The nomadic lifestyle suited us both, and for a while I think we were happy. Thomas lifted the Eiffel Tower picture and caressed it tenderly. After two tours I decided to leave the service, and we wound up settling back in Savannah. Per my father's request, I took over his boat and business and Karen landed a full-time teaching gig at Grantham Middle School. By then, her mood swings had gotten... problematic. Karen, though, got it under control with new meds and by throwing herself fully into teaching, which she loved. Thomas stopped. I hate this. I know, Headley said. Please continue. Thomas growled. Little by little... Elements of her job started to chip away at her. The endless bickering between her co-workers. Piss-poor management by the administrators above her. Mandatory programs like No Child Left Behind, 
race to the top and common core, doing more harm than good. The merciless cutbacks in funding and personnel. The absurd anti-teacher movement that quite effectively turned the middle class in on itself. Karen did her damnedest to endure all the bullshit. But in time, the weight became unbearable. The final straw came after she led a protest against all the compulsory testing the state kept cramming down their throats. She encouraged the students to boycott the exams. Consequently, the protests were a huge success. Huge enough to spread to other districts. But the state didn't like that, did they? Headley said. No, they did not. Atlanta stepped in and quietly put the screws to Karen, pressuring her administrators to act upon every little infraction she committed, to include taking a non-scheduled bathroom break. Finally, they terminated her contract after she colorfully dressed down the parent who accused her of giving their child too much homework. Must have been a hard pill to swallow, Headley said with a hint of a smile. Thomas glowered at the Vracolicus. By the time Karen received her dismissal papers, there wasn't much left of the woman I knew. Just a deflated empty husk that could no longer see the point in carrying on. A few nights later, she snuck into the guest bathroom with a straight razor and a bottle of Xanax and punched her ticket to the other shore. Thomas paused there and returned the picture to the mantel. You were the one to find her, yes? Headley asked. Yes. But there's more, said the Rakolicus. Your story, your illness. Thomas felt his nostrils flare. If you already know all of this, why the fuck have me recite it to you? Impressions, Headley asserted. That is all I get. Impressions. Like with the disease creeping its way from the pleura surrounding your lungs into the neighboring tissue. There is an impression, but nothing more. So, he flittered his hand at Thomas. Rubbing his jaw irritably, Thomas said, Sooner or later, something gets all of us. All of us, Mr. Headley. Had it just been poor genes, I wouldn't have much minded. But I got the mezzo-lung crap during my run working the shipyards in Norfolk. Which also wouldn't have bothered me so much if not for the VA's outright refusal to treat me for it. See, the disease was clever and waited 15 years after I left the service to kick in. When I tried to file the paperwork to get it categorized as service-related, though, the VA said it didn't qualify. I had mountains of evidence citing how badly infested my work environment was with asbestos, but for some reason, the VA mired me in red tape. I fought their decision with everything I had, but those sons of bitches wouldn't budge. I burned up a lot of money on lawyers and research all for nothing. Thomas clenched his fists and sensed his heartbeat quickening. To make matters worse, he went on. The insurance through the boating business tagged it as a pre-existing condition, covering very little of the treatment cost. Talk about your utter lack of humanity. He shook his head. Between all of that and Karen's death, I came to see things in a very different light. Headley appeared to meditate on everything Thomas had just imparted. So, he said, nodding towards the laptop. A means to an end, then. Thomas shrugged. What's your impression telling you? The Vracolicus rose to his feet and joined Thomas by the fireplace. Indeed, he said. Well, my new friend, I believe we could help one another. You need resources. I can commission a vessel of the appropriate size and outfit and to retrieve it. A peculiar form of joy flared in Thomas's chest, driving him to grab the laptop and enlarge the latest photo. There's still some work to be done prying it out of the sediment down there. It may take a few trips. 
Headley tutted and pointed to the balled-up revolver. That was nothing to me, my boy. I would dislodge it myself. Thomas eyed the crushed weapon. Absurd as it was, he had no doubt the Vrykolikos could do it. In that case, he said, I think it's a quid pro quo time, Dr. Lecter. Headley issued a jovial chuckle. <laughs> Dr. Lecter, <laughs> that's good. He chuckled once more, then took a deep breath and proceeded to tell Thomas what he wanted out of the deal. He cut no corners in his explanation, spared no detail. Thomas found the Bracolicus's reasons deeply unsettling, but supposed he was in no position to pass judgment. When Headley was done speaking, he blurred for an instant and reappeared in the doorway leading back to the kitchen. I will return in seven days, at noon sharp. Please be ready, Mr. Vogel. Thomas was about to ask why they needed to wait so long when the fierce fizzling sensation filled his head, rendering him speechless. The sensation only lasted a few minutes but was powerful enough to leave Thomas woozy and confused. Fearing he might collapse from it, he sat on the nearest sofa and glanced around the room in search of Headley. The Vrykolikos was no longer there. Huh, Thomas said wondering if he had hallucinated the whole exchange. Deciding he hadn't, he wasn't ready to go down that road just yet. He stood and, feeling clear-headed enough, ambled back to the fireplace. Well, baby, he said to the Eiffel Tower photo, it looks like it won't be a boring end for me after all. So saying, he turned and headed off to bed. At precisely noon a week later, Headley came rumbling up the manor's long flagstone driveway in a monstrous F-350 with an enclosed titanium trailer in tow. Thomas, having spotted the truck a mile off, wandered down from the manor's wraparound porch and directed the Vrykolikos to park behind his 99 Toyota Corolla. Headley did as instructed and killed the engine. Thomas noted that the words Sweeney's Construction Company were printed in yellow across the F-350's driver's side door. As promised, Headley said, stepping down from the truck's elevated cab and into the harsh midday sun, which, Thomas observed, magnified his sickly appearance tenfold. Of particular note was the Brocolicus's skin, now seeming more ashen than pale. Its tincture, something the fine folks at Crayola might have called elephant gray. It also looked somehow tighter than before, as if it had been shrink-wrapped to his bones. Furthermore, it bore dozens of nasty little pockmarks, which Thomas hadn't previously noticed. Pretty, isn't it? Headley said, adjusting his dark sunglasses. Well, we can walk in sunlight without issue. My kind prefers to avoid it when possible. That sliver of the law, at least, has roots in truth. He glanced up at Thomas. As before, he was dressed in a suit of an unknown vintage, this one black and double-breasted. Looking at me now, you can understand why. To keep from staring, Thomas motioned to the F-350. You in the construction business? Headley nodded. Live long as I have and you learn to get your fingers in a lot of pies. I'm sure, said Thomas, indicating the trailer. Strong enough to hold 7,600 pounds? 10,000 per its rating. And the ship? A modified platform supply vessel named the Viking's Fury. It's smaller than most PSVs, but well capable of accommodating our needs. It'll be waiting for us at the marina in Thunderbolt, on the Wilmington River. My associate owns the marina and will ask no questions. Thomas knew the place, just south of the Saffold Drive Bridge and a stone's throw from Savannah State University. It was a good spot to meet the PSV 
much more so than, say, the Garden City or Ocean Terminals, both of which fell under the auspices of the Georgia Port Authority, trouble they did not need. A ship like that'll need a crew. And it will have one, the Vrakolikus replied, checking his watch. It's time to go. An echo of the fizzling Thomas had felt the night they met came and went again. Thomas huffed irritably at it, rubbed his temples, and went to retrieve his gear. He loaded his things into the back of the F-350 and climbed into the passenger seat. Headley strapped on his seatbelt and brought the truck's rumbling V-8 to life. Now, my boy, let's go make history. While technically within the Savannah Metropolitan Statistical Area, Thomas's manor actually sat just outside of Savannah proper in nearby Bloomingdale. From the front door, it took roughly 20 minutes to reach Thunderbolt. During the drive, Thomas prodded Headley for more on his existence as a Vrakolikus. Headley was curiously generous in his answers, fielding Thomas's inquiries with open aplomb. The two items Thomas most wanted to know about involved the Vrakolikus' lifespan. How long they had been around and how long did they live? As Headley understood it, his kind had originated in Anatolia sometime within the 4th century BC. He could offer no precise date of origin because numerous Vrakolikus had come into being at various points throughout the century, most notably Philip II of Macedon father of Alexander the Great. Regardless of the date, Headley believed their arrival marked the advent of a new evolutionary divergence. Since such divergences often took millennia to fully manifest, it was reasonable to assume his kind was still in its infancy. As to their lifespan, Headley claimed a few of the originals were still around. As long as the Brachalicus has quitted thee to feed on, we can go on living for quite some time. Do you ever get sick or feel pain? Only in the absence of quiddity, Headley admitted. Then the pain is unimaginable. Headley's associate, a wizened, silver-tongued old fisherman named Barkley, met them as they pulled into the marina's parking lot. After a puzzling exchange of insults, the two shook hands warmly, and Barkley pointed to the Viking's fury, which was already moored and set to go. There she is, as promised, my friend, the man said. Thomas had the impression the two went way back. This way, if you please. They boarded swiftly, and Barkley introduced them to the crew, four grizzled sailors and their slightly less grizzled captain. Following the introductions, Headley conferred with the captain while the others set to work unmooring the vessel. Afterwards, the captain approached Thomas for the necessary coordinates. Thomas provided them, and less than five minutes later, they embarked. The trip down the Wilmington was slow and peaceful. Thomas spent the majority of it pacing about the stern checking out the boat's riggings and watching the land creep by. Occasionally, river children appeared along the shoreline, muddy and waving frenetically, and Thomas waved back at them. The ship had just passed the inlet to Skidaway River when Headley joined Thomas by the starboard taffrail. I've always preferred the land over the sea, but there is something about being on a ship that beckons to the soul. Thomas nodded. Throughout the 57 years he had been alive, the majority of the instances in which he experienced true tranquility had occurred while he was surrounded by vast expanses of water. In case you still have doubts about the crew, Headley said, changing subjects. Uh, look there. He indicated a nearby crewman who was busy fitting pieces of a large wooden crate together work it should have taken at least two men to accomplish. Notice his pallor? Headley asked. Notice his clothes? The man had on a dirty blue sweater and equally dirty corduroys, garments suited for much cooler weather. The man's skin was also quite pale, 
a rarity for a southern sea dog. The two points struck home. He's like you, Thomas said. The other three as well? Yes, Edley replied. I employ many of my kind in my various endeavors, and I help them become what they are meant to become. Do they know what we're doing? They will when we bring it aboard. They're not fools. But rest assured, our plans will not be affected. Headley let this hang in the air before striding off towards the companionway that accessed the ship's elevated bridge. As soon as Headley was out of sight, the crewmen they had just been talking about grinned over at Thomas, and the now familiar fizzling sensation enveloped Thomas's brain. Distraught by the intensity of the feeling, Thomas shouted at the Rocolicus to leave him be. A millisecond later, the crewman fell to the deck, grabbing his head as if to keep it from coming apart. In a fit of self-preservation, he made several strange hand signals in the direction of the bridge, and all at once his torment stopped. Teeth clenched, he got up and scurried toward the ship's main cabin, upon which the bridge sat like a head upon a neck. Once inside, he slammed the door shut behind him. Thomas snarled after the fleeing crewman, issuing a string of obscenities. Headley feeding on him was one thing. He'd be damned if he let the other Cretans do it too. Leeches! He shouted at the lot of them, only to be drowned out by a loud horn blast that emanated from the ship's intercom. Befuddled, Thomas looked about and noticed the land on both sides receding, giving way to an immense gulf of shimmering water. What's all sound? A voice called from somewhere above him. Thomas looked up and saw Headley standing atop the companionway. No shit! Thomas barked back, the aggravation of having been fed upon still well stoked. Eldon, we need to talk. I know. And I'll put a stop to it, Headley replied. I guess I should be grateful, but if it happens again by any of you, I'm done. Headley seemed amused by the demand. Sure, he said, angling his face toward the open sea. The cabin says it'll be another hour. There's food in the galley for you, if you wish. He flashed one of his long-toothed smiles and returned to the bridge. Wondering if the Rocolicus would keep his word, Thomas meandered to the vessel's port side and fixed his gaze on the sea. The sight of all those sparkling little waves placated him, making quick work of his distress like few other things could. He waited until he was sufficiently calmed, then sought out his gear and fished some of his pain meds from his dry bag. The ones he had ate at breakfast were beginning to wear off, and he had no intention of suffering needlessly throughout the extraction process. Washing the peels down with a swig from the fresh bottle of killed baggins he had brought with him, he found a quiet spot near the ship's stern and spent the next hour lost in the ocean's beauty. Headley had been underwater at the bottom of Wausau Sound for almost ten minutes when the chain sets fixed to the ship's larger crane began to shake violently. Less than a minute later, the chains went still and taut. Observing this, the crewman manning the crane's controls engaged the hoisting motor, and the thick wire rope started to retract. It took another ten minutes before the black metal object broke the surface a 7,600-pound Lazarus resurrected from its watery grave. Up, up it went, wrapped tightly in nylon slings, and then down into the crate it lowered. Thomas's heart pounded the entire time, and tears leaked from the corners of his eyes. There was a splashing sound on the starboard side, and Headley came crawling back aboard. He toweled off, dressed and conferred again with the captain, they did not speak very long, and when they were finished, Headley watched the crewmen remove the slings from the Mark 15 thermonuclear bomb. The men did their work in silence and retreated to the main cabin when there was nothing left to do. In their absence, Headley called Thomas over to the crate. 
So, Headley said, the easy part is finished. Now comes the much harder part. Thomas studied the bomb, admiring its fully excavated form. Part of him never believed it would see the light of day. Yeah, you know, we never discussed this before, but you're aware there was always a chance the part that sets it off, the detonator capsule, was removed. Headley grinned. No, my friend. This beautiful device is fully intact. There are some modifications to make, yes, but those are minor. The look in his eyes said he knew for sure, and Thomas accepted that. The Vrykolikus's long, thin fingers grasped Thomas's shoulder almost tenderly, and then he became a blur. Where he went, Thomas didn't know or care. For a while thereafter, Thomas remained by the crate, eyes bouncing from the Mark 15 to the sea and back again. Amid the bouncing, he thought of Oppenheimer's famous paraphrasing of the Bhagavad Gita quote years after the first atomic detonation at Trinity. Now I am become death, destroyer of worlds. At that precise moment, the quote aptly summed up how Thomas felt. Only he would have replaced the word worlds with cities and sanded cities down to its singular form. As to which particular city, he wasn't quite sure yet, but he had a couple in mind. The U-Haul cargo van pulled off of Massachusetts Avenue onto Louisiana and slowed to a crawl. Ahead on the right appeared a run of three open parking spots. Seeing them, Thomas eased the van in and shut the engine off. It had been a week since they rescued the bomb from the ocean floor, and only three days since Headley had returned from Panama City, where he had gone to visit a munitions expert regarding the detonator capsule. When the Vrykolikus returned, he seemed pleased, and he and Thomas resumed an unfinished conversation about the where of their plan. Thomas had been dead set on Atlanta, as much of his anguish stemmed from the state capitol. Headley, meanwhile, pushed Thomas to think bigger, much bigger. They came to an impasse, which Thomas luckily got them out of by deciding Headley was right. Thomas recalled a great deal of the fizzling going on in his head, but afterwards he no longer understood what the feeling meant. He just knew Headley was absolutely right and agreed going up north was the best plan. From where he was parked, he could just make out the bone-white dome of the Capitol building. It was an impressive structure in an impressive city. Thomas removed the keys from the ignition and eyed his watch. Five minutes until three. Five minutes until showtime. He tried to remember what that meant exactly, but those details had gone a little fuzzy. It seemed that part of him was gone now. He was about to crack open a can of Sprite when someone knocked on the driver's window. A city cop, Thomas saw. The man was tall and dark-skinned with kind, beautiful eyes and a friendly expression. Thomas rolled the window down. Hi there. Afternoon, sir, the cop said, smiling. This your van? The easy way he spoke told Thomas he was a good man, a professional who had joined the force because he genuinely wanted to help the devoted father and husband type. My boss is rental, Thomas said, meaning Headley. Uh, there a problem? The cop asked him to get out of the vehicle. Thomas did, and they walked around to the U-Haul's rear end, which hung nearly to the ground with the Mark 15's weight. Got some heavy in there? The cop asked. Yep, Thomas replied. Mind if we take a look? Thomas looked at his watch again, a minute until noon. I don't see why not, he said, and opened the rolling door. The cop peered inside. His face instantly changed, and his instincts brought his hand to his sidearm. Sir, what the hell is that? A Mark 15 nuclear bomb, Thomas replied. The Tybee bomb, it's called. I found it in the ocean near Savannah and brought it up here. The cop pointed his gun at Thomas. He looked scared. He spoke frantically into his radio, calling for help. 
The sight of his fear stirred something in Thomas, and a lingering nuance of what was happening came to him. The nuance showed him his boiling hatred, and it coupled with the sense of how many innocent people, how many good men, women, and children would perish if he reached in his pocket and activated the remote detonator. The notion unhinged him, and everything got muddled in his head. I'm sorry, officer, he said, feeling now like a ghost instead of a man, like someone who had been partially eaten by a lion and left to die in the wilderness. I really am sorry. I don't want to do it. The cop was yelling at him to get down, yelling into his radio to start evacuating everyone and everything. Jesus, he said. My wife and son, Sheila, Danny. Thomas checked his watch. A minute passed. Karen, he said, falling to his knees weeping. I'm sorry, baby. I can't do it. I just can't do it. He set the remote detonator on the asphalt and put his hands behind his head. Downtown Baltimore Eldon Headley sat alone at a small wrought iron table outside a coffee shop called Grounds for Happiness. He sipped his flavorless coffee and eyed his Rolex. A minute past noon. Around him, young people chatted excitedly while staring at their cell phones, a trend Headley did not understand. He waited another minute before deciding Thomas had failed him. Unconcerned, he got his own cell phone out and dialed the magic number. His thumb hovered over the call button, then gently pressed it. He set the phone on the table. Seconds later, the southwestern sky became brighter than a thousand suns. People screamed, covering their eyes. Soon, the ground began rumbling as if struck by a mild earthquake. More screaming. Windows shattered. People fell to the ground. Electronics ceased working. 3.8 megatons in full effect. Headley removed the sunglasses and watched as the mushroom cloud bloomed up from the nation's capital. Already he could feel the floodgates opening, the millions of conduits full and flowing. He stood and prepared himself for the grand feast. He would start here and circle around DC, or what was left of it. The way he figured, the closer to the epicenter, the higher the suffering. After his first time around, if all went well, he would be able to feel something besides pain again. He would know his own quiddity or something close to it. If not, he would start over and keep going round and round until he did. Straightening his tie, Headley pushed in his chair and began the feeding. You've been listening to Quiddity by author W.B. Stickle. A good reminder that sometimes all it takes to keep going is a dream. But once that dream is realized, you'd better come up with another one fast, because it's all over. <coughs> a little about the author. W.B. Stickle lives with his family in central New York. By day, he works for the Air Force doing geeky communication stuff. By night, he reads and writes as much as life allows. His short fiction has appeared in over a dozen magazines and anthologies, to include Sanitarium Magazine and the Lovecraft-inspired collection Whispers from the Abyss. His stories have also appeared as podcast episodes on Tales to Terrify, Nocturnal Transmissions, Horror Hill, Drew Blood's Dark Tales, which are his most prestigious appearances, of course, and Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. He is still afraid of Teletubbies, but he's receiving helpful counseling for it. 
Jeff and I have been discussing this issue, WB, and we think the best way to get over this fear is to dress up your counselor like a Teletubby and climb on top of her for a bit. We're sure it'll work. And you're welcome. <clears throat> you can find WB at his old ass Facebook profile, www.facebook.com forward slash WBSTICKEL. WB Stickle. And while you're at it, please remember to stop by our Apple Podcast page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and subscribe. The charts are based on subscriptions, not listens, by the way. So feel free to accidentally subscribe as many times as you want. I won't tell anyone, I promise. And if you feel like spreading the word and helping old Drew Blood out and convincing a friend or two to subscribe to my podcast, that would help me out greatly, and I'd really appreciate it. To hear a premium ad-free edition of tonight's and all our other podcast episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the patrons link in the upper menu. You'll find yourself at chillintalesfordarknights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 a month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program and all our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook and Instagram, and sometimes Twitter. Sometimes. And remember, we're accepting submissions. If you've got a story or two you'd like to be featured on this show, send it to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If selected, you'll get the full treatment. Well, I'm afraid this is where we part ways, friend. At least till next week. So grab a drink for the road. And I thank you for maintaining your faculties tonight. Not like some people. Tonight my shout out is to all the listeners that have joined us for these past two seasons. I do this for y'all, y'all. Thank you for your love and support, and the comments are always fun to read. Even the bad ones, written by men with little dicks. So may the wind be at your back, and may the road rise up to meet you. Hang on to your dreams, and you too might make it to season three without blowing yourself up. But in the meantime, go fuck yourselves. <laughs> See everyone at season three. Good night, y'all. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.